Hey, welcome to the show. This is Into the Ultra. I'm Brian Stillman. I'm your host. I'm here with Chris Burdett. He is a fantasy, science fiction, weirdo, gaming illustrator, um, and a friend of mine, like so many of the people on this show, because I'm mining, mining my friends. Um, but Chris, thank you so much for, for being on the show. Of course, I, anytime. Awesome. Well, that's good to know. I will call you up regularly. And yes, we will please just do. Keep and doing uh, this. my lovely wife, Asha Nude, is also here with me today. I put also, on makeup. She put on makeup for this. And pants. Hey, Asha. Yes. <laughs> uh, don't forget author, because apparently I wrote a book. So apparently I'm an author and now, an illustrator now. Now you are an author. I'm going to say celebrated author. Oh, there we go. <laughs> let's, let's talk a little bit about, I want to start by talking about your latest project, because I know this is something you've been working on for a long time. What is The Grand Bazaar of Ether Vandalia? It is going to be a series of books. Um, I've completed the first book. It's a series of interconnected um, stories and artwork. It's kind of set up like a monster manual where there's different entries. In the, the, this first book, there are 30 entries. And within each entry, there are multiple voices that talk about each entry. So you have like the average man on the street. So you walk up to someone and like, what do you think about this monster? Right, and it's right. like their hot take. So there's, there's two different versions of that. Some might be poems or, uh, you know, interviews and different kind of stuff. And then after that, you have a lesser scholar and then you have a more experienced scholar. You have Ethra's view and then it all ends with a skeptic's view of what's going on. Um, so it's kind of, it's left up to the reader of what's fix, fiction and what's fact. And this is a whole world that you've created. It's all original art. It's all original story, all original yes. storytelling um, that you've been building up over the last 20, 22 years. 22 years. What I'm, I'm most interested in with the bazaar is um, it is this kind of unadulterated, unfiltered, Christopher Burdett imagination. You know what I yeah. mean? Like one of the things that I remember you showing me once was your redrawing of the monster manual. And yeah. you took all the different monsters and just reinterpreted them however you want. This is a step even further. This is just you without art orders. Is it weird having yourself as a client? Uh, no, because I mean, I mean, since I was a little kid, uh, I was the client. I was always making work for myself. When I, I mean, I've made monsters from the beginning. I mean, there was no, there was no time when I was not making marks that it wasn't dinosaurs or stuff influenced by Godzilla and Ultraman. And then in time, when I discovered the monster manual, and I, you know, the the day I, I, it was it was a two. Two for a day, I went to a friend's house that lived four houses down in the neighborhood, and he had an older brother that was in Dungeons and Dragons. But my friend and I were a couple years back, and I walked into the brother's bedroom, and he had miniatures, and he had the monster manual, and I saw this, and it changed everything. I immediately went home and got out my modeling clay and started sculpting monsters. And I did drawings of the monsters. And I started, you know, figuring out what they did and why they did it and all this stuff. And I, that was my introduction to Dungeons and Dragons was me making my own monsters. And then right. in a couple of years, I was at a flea market at a, at a condemned, uh, outdoor theater, you know, drive-in theater. And there was this dude in the back of his car. And for five bucks, he, he had stacks and stacks and stacks of mon uh, first, first edition D&D books. And I got my Monster Manual. Then I got my Monster Manual 2. And then I got my Fiend Folio. And I never looked back. And it was just kind of like, I had no interest in the game. I didn't want to play this. Whatever this game was, I didn't care. I didn't, I didn't, buy, the, I didn't buy the player's handbook. I didn't buy the Dungeon Master's handbook. They didn't have any monsters in them. They didn't have the art. Right, right, right. I wanted the books with the art. And so I, these, these numbers and this information in this, these books, it was like another language to me. And that's why I, it, I, like, I wanted to solve this riddle of what this stuff was. I, I didn't want, the, I didn't want the, the, the manual that actually told me what it was. I wanted to like, make up my own stories and come up with my own ideas of what these monsters were and what what this information meant. 
do you feel like um, the Grand Bazaar then is that sort of full realization of that? Like, yes. here's what these monsters mean because I'm creating, I'm exploring this world of my own creation. Oh yeah, the, the, definitely. And that, you know, and we, you know, I, you and uh, Jeff Solomon have stepped in to create Dungeon Dragon stats for the monsters, you know, that okay. was part of the book. And I mean, that really was the realization of the journey because having stats that are Dungeons & Dragons stats and seeing that evolution of where I've created something and then it's gone further to kind of morph with- Right, the, bringing it back. And, yeah, the, yeah. The, circle, the circle is now complete. When I left you, <laughs> I was the learner, but now I am the master. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was definitely fun to work on. It was fun to sort of dig into this thing you've created, this world that you've built, um, and look at it on a level where it's like, okay, I have to think about what these things actually do in game terms, because yeah. that's how I translate my life entirely anyway. It's like, how does this, it's like, oh, I want to go buy this cupcake. What skill check do I need to roll? <laughs> it's like, sir, would you just buy the cupcake? Put the dice down. No, 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 wait, I got to see. Ah, crap. No, dude, I rolled a natural 20. This cupcake is mine. Right. I'll another cupcake. <laughs> or you roll a one and you're just like, oh, I'm sorry, no cupcake for me. And you yeah, just or it's out. like, uh, here's a 20. Can I still get the cupcake? Right. <laughs> um, what's the biggest trick um, not trick, but the biggest thing you've learned uh, when it comes to creating whole worlds. Um, so it's not just, hey, I need to design this one character or this one monster, but when approaching whole worlds, what have you learned that, that like, what do you need to do to, to, to accomplish that? You need to, well, for me, this, you know, this is all for yeah, me. Of course. Because um, uh, when I was building my world, I would, I would think of something that would be interesting I would come up with a, like a twist, a plot twist or something that I would like to do. And then I have to find out why hmm. I have to answer why it's like, okay, I want to do this, but why I'm creating a world that I want to have explanations and I want to have an understanding and things need to work together. So if, if X, Y, and Z is happening, I need to know that it's because of A, B, and C. Right. And it's just kind of having that understanding of the world. I never want to be in a situation where you know, I, I, I state that, you know, there is another Jedi after Luke leaves Yoda. And then in the, the next movie, I have to come up with another Jedi. Right. Right. <laughs> All right. Uh-huh. <clears throat> um, right. When it comes to illustrating the world, like one of the things I really liked about the, the drawings I've seen for uh, the Grand Bazaar. So, yeah, you have the individual character and creature drawings, but then you also have these huge world panoramas um, that you've created that show the environments, that show the hustle and bustle of this grand bazaar, that show, you know, top cutaway views of this, of this giant city under a tent. How do you approach something like that um, to, to make it feel uh, real and organic? You know, they talk, Star Wars, you know, they talk about how it's a lived in world and yeah. the designers were very attentive to like, we're going to put like a random bottle on the floor in the corner of a canteen, you know, just little things that don't mean anything, yeah. but they mean something. They, they create something. How do you approach something like that? Uh, again, it was, it's been a multi-decade process to get there because I, when I started, all, all I ever wanted to do with my art was to draw a single standalone monster in a void. Just do this, the, the, you know, the, the quarter page monster making the pose, doing right. the thing and that's it, you know, and that, and it's, you know, the industry needed more from me. The, my clients needed me to start putting these monsters into context. Mm -hmm. So I would put the monster in a little bit of a background with, oh, maybe some trees and stuff. And then they was like, oh, look, it's, it's near a city. And then suddenly this monster is in a city. And then this monster is in a city with all this other background. And then I started doing, you know, my work for the Star Wars games. I'm like, you know, if I'm going to be doing Efant Mon, I'm going to do Efant Mon 
in Jabba's palace, but I'm going to put in four other aliens that I really wanted to paint too. Mm -hmm. And I want to create this kind of little, little corner of Jabba's palace that no one's ever seen, but it's how I envision it. And then I do that there. And then I'm going to do, I need to do a piece that's happening in Mos Eisley. So I do a piece that's, and I get out all of my episode one, a micro machine toys that are almost EPSA and I, I position them and I do reference shots and I begin to build this little part of Tatooine that no one's ever seen before. Right. And it's, it's that progression. And so but finally, when it comes to my work and doing my things, I've thankfully I've, I've traveled through Europe. I've seen what old cities look like in Italy, in Croatia, in, 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 in England, you know, in Germany, that you have these places that have been lived in for hundreds, if not thousands of years, and you kind of get a feel for what these things look like. And it's that progression and that, you know, maturity. And it's like having those experiences, you know, and like I said, I couldn't have done it 20 years ago, but right, now right. having soaked up the world and mm. experienced all these things, I can now turn around and, I have a voice, you know, I have an informed voice. I, I now, when I'm making my marks, I have marks with intention. And I have now taken where I'm like, taking my monsters where I'm like, oh, I'm going to put a cool thing on its belt. And that, right. with that, that cool thing on this belt is actually, you know, it helps it communicate with other creatures and it's a, it's a communication rod and that will be cool. And then I, it has its prayer beads and it has a pouch where it keeps, you know, salt because it needs to have lots of salt. You know, I've taken that where I now you know, move it into the entire world. So it's like, well, this store is a bakery, but next door is a store that sells eggs. And they right. all about eggs and the store, you know, the bakery, the baker buys its eggs from its neighbor next door. And there's a, there's a connection there. So it's so, asking that why, I mean, it's continuing yes. that process of why, well, why is that here? And maybe what's it doing? What's it accomplishing? That's really, it's that same process, but blown up. I've talked about this before. It's like, in many ways, I think artists, um, are all creating their own language. Their marks on paper, on a panel, on canvas, it's a language. You know, we are yeah. making abstract marks and forms and shapes, but taken as a whole, typically it is understandable by everyone else. Right, you know, right, right. In their own visual language. And everyone has their own flavor. So, you know, you right. look at people and some people are very expressionist. They're very loose. You know, they have big, broad brush strokes, but, you know, you can still see what they're getting at. And other people, it's, it's all about the line and you're very intricate and you're, you know, it's, it's all different, but we're like all like different dialects, language. like different dialects, dialects and language. Yes. That's, that's um, what but I'll they're look. still speaking monster <laughs> or yeah, whatever. And, <laughs> still, you know, still speaking fantasy art or science fiction or, um, for you, what, what's the trick? What's the key? Um, because you design monsters through all your different areas of art. I mean, Grand Bazaar monsters are a big part of it. Your D&D work, lots of monsters. So for you, what, what's the key to a good monster? What makes a good, exciting, interesting monster? Um, at first, I didn't know. But I think now, looking back, it's about narrative. The monster needs to tell a story. It's it's you are you are trying to express something, you know, because if you look at Frankenstein, Dracula, the Gill Man, the Mummy, the the classic like archetypal monsters, zombies, they are a metaphor. They are trying to talk about something. Mm -hmm. Frankenstein, it's a it's a concept about dealing with man playing God. With dr uh, vampires, it's it's an issue of blood, sexuality, you know, dealing with religion. There's, there's stuff. Mummy, you have the old religions, the old world dealing, you know, there's juxtapositions. Wolfman, right. the beast within. You, they, they're metaphors. They're, they're, they're conversation starters. And it's how you interpret those. So it's, you know, at this point in, you know, we've, we've been designing monsters for thousands of years. Humans have been making monsters. We have Grendel that goes yeah. back thousands of years. We have demons and devils and Satan and we have, you know, angels and we have all this stuff. We have monsters. We've been making monsters, the Greeks and the Romans, Cyclops, you know, Hydras. We have all this history. We, um, humans make monsters and they're part of storytelling. It's a narrative. 
it's a it's a definite like you know genre based communication device that artists right. can use to talk about things. So that's you it's abstracted, but it's still relevant. Uh, when approaching the then design of a monster, um, like you and I once talked, and you had mentioned something to me that how you you have sort of an issue with dragons, at least traditionally, because, and I don't know if you remember this, because they have these extra pair of limbs, but there's no like muscle structure to accommodate them. You know, you've got two arms, you've got two legs, and then all of a sudden these other things coming out of your back and there's chest muscles are already busy with the arms. And yeah. so, so when you approach the actual design of a monster, um, what are your go-to sort of techniques and, and approaches and things like that? How well, I mean, I, I, I look at the I look at the real world. I look at what you know, Mother Nature, Gaia, Earth, you know, Terra, whatever we're going to call it. Uh, there has been life on this planet for millions of years, and they've worked out so many amazing versions and methods and styles and functionality of things that work. So all we have to do is look at the world around us and you know i there are no vertebrates that have six limbs you know it's we all have four bats have two legs and two wings birds have two legs and two wings pterodons and pterodactyls two legs and two wings and you know dogs and cats they have four limbs humans we have two arms and two legs there's there's a functionality there that seems to work. Insects, invertebrates, there's, they got a lot going on that they can do. Throwing wings on something, you have to have a certain amount of musculature and chest compassion. I mean, people have done scientific breakdowns. If humans had wings, what would we look like? And I think they, our chest cavity would be four feet deep to... <laughs> right. To 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 uh, to contain the amount of muscle mass we would need to have for wings. So when you're creating though fantasy creatures, yeah, how much leeway then do you leave yourself though to break those rules and to oh. say screw it, I'm giving them wings. Oh yeah, well yeah, we have we have plenty of room to do that. Yeah, we, right. but but there but as an individual, I I do have my limits, and that's right. that's where I say you know when I was saying that sometimes I feel like I haven't gone full me me yet with some of my designs is because there's that that awareness of like well this still needs to exist on this planet you know I've I've made a planet it it has rules you know I'm I, I haven't really established what the gravity is or whatever but I assume we're we're dealing with an Earth like planet. Right. So if there's going to be a creature that's 20 feet tall and flies, it's going to have a 90 foot wingspan because it, right. it needs to it needs to be able to function. Right. So and then and, and luckily, I mean, we have these great pterodons to look at that had yeah they were immense and they had these huge heads with these huge crests and they had these huge wingspans and they would stay af they theorized that they stayed a flight could for months, you know, days, weeks, months, that once they were in the air, they lived in the air. So it's kind of taking that and going, okay, so this mm. could exist. Let me just tweak it a little. Let me just right, take right. extra, extra little bit. Um, so to, to sort of shift a little to something like Dungeons and Dragons. So in the, like you're a gamer. Yes. Um, and you, like you just, like you told us earlier, you, you grew up playing D&D, &D, um, and now you're working with these monsters and these creatures that you grew up playing. What's it like for you as both an artist and a gamer to get to tackle these things that have this long legacy, you know, that have a history behind them? It's, it's been a dream come true. It is really, to, to be able to because there's a thing uh, when I when I started doing illustration for D and D, it was in fourth edition, and I was working on the Monster Manual two, and one of the pieces that I had to illustrate was the Ankhag, and that was based off of Tom Bax's drawings from third edition mm -hmm. that I had a miniature of. So and, you know, I always thought the Ankhag was a cool creature, subterranean insect, giant insect, 
I'm all in it. You know, I'm, I'm in it to win it with giant uh, subterranean insects because I have giant subterranean insects in the Grand Bazaar. Hmm. Wonder how that happened. Um, so, you know, this Ankeg. So I, I did the illustration and it, you know, it was early in my career and it was like, that was good enough. But when fifth edition came around, one of the pieces I was tasked with to redesign was the Ankeg. So I was like, wow, full circle. So I kind of really made this thing that I would expect to see. Like if I was a gamer and I was playing a game, what would be horrifying and cool to come burrowing out of the ground to attack my players? And uh, I think coming out pretty soon is a miniature based on my design, my illustration yep. in the Monster Manual. So I'm really excited about that. I can't wait, can't wait to get one of those. But yeah, that's kind of, it's kind of like, it's the full circle. And it, it, for me, there was always, um, I think it was in, it was in an early uh, D&D assignment that I did. It was like the, the, the notes were, and make it cool. And that's always what I think about. It's like, it's, you know, it's do a goblin, but make it cool. You know, do this monster, but make it cool. And for me, for Dungeons and Dragons work, that's what it's all about. And well, for the Ankeg, what I find yeah. interesting is this is so I'm thinking back all the way to AD and D, first edition, Monster Manual. Trampier did the Ankeg, and I always remember that little he also did a little cartoon where there's an Ankeg like chasing a little farmer down like a path and the farmer's running yeah. away in the Ankeg. Oh yeah. So when working with creatures like that that have this long legacy. Um, especially when it's a legacy of art that you grew up admiring. Yeah. Is there an added pressure there to be like, I'm building on this thing that goes all the way back to Dave freaking Trampier? Um, yes. And 10 years ago, it was crushing. But at this point, it's kind of like I realized that, you know, I am part of that lineage and kind mm -hmm. of like stepping back. And it, it's not about me. It's I am I'm doing a job and I'm working for a company that is aware of what they're doing. They, you know, they know what they have. And it's like, we're all working together to make the next thing, the next incarnation of this awesome thing that's been going on for over 40 years. You know, and it's like, we're all in this together and we're going to do something cool. And it's that, that's where I find it interesting. So it's like, especially working on the concept work for fifth edition, there was definitely that it's like, okay, fifth edition, let's do this and let's go in hard and have lots of fun and do stuff. And I remember at one point, because I, I started doing all the concept work with John Shindahedi before he left Wizards. And there would there'd be days where I get feedback from him and he's like, dude, you are on fire right now. Because I would be like, literally the first sketch, I would get, I'd send him six sketches, but it's the first one that I'm like, boom. And he's just like, yeah, that's it. You nailed it. Like first off you know, first sketch of the, of the thing that you did is what we're going with. Cause it's like, you immediately nailed it. And it was kind of what it was getting to that mindset. It's kind of like, you know, I have 40 years of people behind me and it's now it's, I've picked up my brush. I've picked up my pencil and we're going to go forward for the next however years till they do sixth edition. It's like the because, spirit you know, of your, the, your artistic ancestors, the spirits yeah, are behind you. Know, you. I'm laying there on the floor and I hear Luke and I hear Mace Windu and I, <laughs> I, I hear, you know, Kanan and Ahsoka. And it's like, I get up and I kill the emperor. You know, it's like, it's well, like I've interviewed, I mean, I've interviewed uh, the artist, Jeff D who early Dungeons and Dragons artist did tons of module covers, but also did a lot of interior art. Um, really one of the great black and white illustrators of uh, Dungeons and Dragons history. And he talked about, I asked him, you know, how does it feel to see other people come along and reinterpret stuff that for a while yours was the thing? And he said he loves it. His feeling is that it's great to see people come along and build upon the work and advance the work and, and move things forward, um, whether it's in game design or monsters or the, you know, just the art itself. So I do feel like there's this legacy where... I think the early guys are happy to see the new guys come through and tackle these monsters that they tackled 30 years ago, 40 years ago, um, and, and come up with something new and exciting. Oh yeah. And it's like, you know, and I did, I did a lizard man 
fourth, fifth edition. That's, you know, it's, that's, that's a huge history because, you know, it talk, goes all the way back to first edition, that first edition. And that first edition, Lizard Man by Trompier was, to me, that's, that's a Lizard Man, you know. It goes and back even further. I mean, it goes yeah. back to original D&D where Greg Bell drew the original Lizard Man that was kind of the TSR logo for a while. And he's holding that, that spear and he's kind of looking all savage. So yeah. that is a figure that goes, that's a creature that goes back to the very beginning, 1974. Yeah. And it, 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 you know, and then the, uh, Steve Prescott's Lizard Men for, mm. I guess, third and fourth edition, he established what the, D, the, the contemporary D&D Lizard Men are with, mm. with the big crest. So I, I, when I did my Lizard Man, um, I, you know, I really thanked my art director, Kate Irwin. I was just like, thank you so much for giving me this Lizard Men design. And she's like, what? I'm like, dude, I... I played a lizard man in second edition. <laughs> it's like, cause I was all about the uh, inhuman, you know, the, yeah, the monster life. characters and stuff. Yeah. The monster characters. I played a, a, a Koatoa. I played uh, a lizard man. I played a Sauron. I like, I did, if it was the, the closest thing to a human I ever played was a dwarf, you know, it's well, like, there, the lizard man is also a classic uh, staple of D and D, like you need an army of bad guys, bunch of lizard men, yeah. um, you know, them goblins, hobgoblins, orcs, but they're, this kind of baseline foundational, okay, I need large groups of bad guys. Cobalt. Lizard men are always a fun one. Co well, cobalts. It's hard to even call them large groups of bad guys. They're just fodder. Yeah. Um, oh, so good. But lizard men, I mean, they have that kind of, they're like staples. They, they're the rice and beans of D&D. &D. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I got to, I got to do an illustration of a, the contemporary lizard man playable character. Mm. And that's that's that was the thing. And they, they said it was going to be a miniature, and they still haven't put it out. So <laughs> I, fingers crossed. So you also do a lot of work with Magic: The Gathering. Um, is was... the, a few pieces, <laughs> a few pieces here and there. Um, do you approach that art, that fantasy art, differently than you approach Dungeons and Dragons fantasy art? Um, and I don't mean just stylistically; they're a little different, but just as an artist are you approaching them differently yes i i really i really do because there's a different legacy that magic the gathering has and um and they they definitely want a different finished product than say magic does i mean D, &D does right you know there's you know they it's it's a different you know it's the same client in many ways it's the same client but it's they need a, a different in product, so they they want something more cinematic, something more dynamic, something very like it's it's each piece is like a film frame. So you're watching the Magic: The Gathering game, and the, suddenly the monster appears, still frame. That's that's the piece you do. It, so you're creating. It's getting back to what, like what you said earlier. There's more environmental elements. There's yeah. more setting it in a in a space. Um, does that take you back to what you're doing with Star Wars? Because a lot of those cards, you know, they were the Star Wars cards, but again, creating a single scene, a single moment, but with a very cinematic, like that's where the camera is for that shot in what is presumably some longer scene of awesomeness. I mean, it, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, definitely. Um, say like the Salacious Crumb piece that I did. Um, when I got the assignment, they needed Salacious Crumb hanging from a rafter um, in, in somewhere. They, it was just kind of, it was kind of vague. They're like, they just like have Salacious Crumb hanging from a rafter. And I'm like, really guys? And I, 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 I contacted my art director. And I'm like, I'm really kind of seeing Salacious Crumb sitting on Jabba's dais, but it, it's, it's Salacious Crumb looking at a, a a being that's falling through the, tr uh, the, the, the trap door into the Rancor pit. Mm -hmm. It's that moment of Slice's Crumb like laughing, putting his thumb up. It's like, you're going down. And there's that last moment that you're looking up at Jabba in Slice's Crumb as you're going through the, yeah, the, yeah. the floor trap. And that's, that's the moment that, um, that I wanted to capture. You know, when I had to do Jabba's Rancor in the pit below, I picked what would what was Luke's POV, basically. Mm -hmm. So I had Luke's POV um, looking up and the, the Jabba had, I mean, the Rancor has the Gamorrean guard. It's getting ready. It's getting ready to pick it up and eat it. And at the 
very top, you can see, you know, every, all of the aliens and creatures looking down through the grating. And there, you know, that moment, I want to be able to like, it, that moment that everyone has, that knows, but it's yeah. a different view. You know, you never got to see that view. And that, so, that's where I, I, that's where I want to approach it. And it, you know, it ties back to magic. It's like, if you need a, um, you know, they need this weird chimera bursting out of the water that's made of a hawk and an eel and all this stuff. And it's kind of like, you know, it's like, all right, have that hero shot of it bursting up with that dynamic twist, you know, a Dutch, Dutch angle of, of the card art and kind of go from there. Is there a magic card that you've worked on that was particularly fun or enjoyable or you, you liked the best? You know, I always hate to ask, what was your favorite magic card that you worked on? Because sometimes that's a hard one to answer. So I'll ask that, but I'll also say, or the alternate question is, was there a card that was a particularly fun experience or, or something that stands out for you that you've worked well, on? Well, I, I think the, the full circle, like the card that I'm ha most happy with was the uh, the Shimmerwing Chimera that came out in the second Ther Theros set. When the first Theros set came out, I really wanted to do a Chimera, and I never got one. And I was just kind of one of those things, I'm like, oh man, I really wanted to do a Chimera. So full circle, you know, when it came back around, I got to do a Chimera, it was really cool. And um, my in-house art director, my wife, Asha, um, really helped me get it to the next level because I, I, it, I was, you know, we, we all have our strengths and weaknesses and she was able to push me a little bit further with the piece and had me change some of the, uh, the sizing of the background and kind of the, the way the, the figure was on the, uh, in, in the pan, you know, in the, in the image and really kind of had me fine tune it to where it needed to be. And when and it was all said and done, it's still my currently my favorite piece that I've done. You know, it really satisfied a lot with me. Uh, the pieces that the fans love were the lionfish, most currently the lionfish from from Theros, and then um, the dragons of Tarkir. I did the giant carp. Who, uh, who, or what? I suppose are some of your favorite monsters um, across media, movies, TV, comic <laughs> books, whatever. Um, who are some of your favorite monsters? Godzilla. Godzilla, just straight up. Godzilla, um, I love the Trandoshans and Star Wars and the Mon Calamari. Uh, Bosk and Admiral Akbar were my two favorite Star Wars char characters, uh, but Godzilla was where it's at. I mean, um, with within D and D, it's Beholders and Elithids. Those are my favorites. Uh, you know, I why I just, why Godzilla? What what makes Godzilla so special? What makes him so enduring? He is a metaphor. I mean, if you would, like, and I was talking earlier about metaphors, he is the manifestation of nuclear power on the planet. I mean, the, the Japanese embodied the, the trauma and the horrors of atomic warfare on themselves and manifested Godzilla. I don't think there's anything more pure as a metaphor and as a monster in Godzilla because I mean I mean it has been abstracted but but I mean 1954 Godzilla is a an open letter to the rest of the world about the horrors of nuclear warfare um you you also mentioned I know you're a huge fan of Bosk what what makes that such a compelling creature and and character because on screen he's he's barely there yeah but but for me it's 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 that moment, well, he's a space lizard, and I'm all about lizards. I love reptiles and amphibians. I love reptiles in general, and then it's a and, and reptile. And just so people know, Bosk is the reptilian bounty hunter from Empire Strikes Back. I, I, I feel like all of you probably know that, but I'm gonna mention it just in case for-, for you, get, you see his foot, and you pan up, and he says, <laughs> And it's like, you know, it's, that's the end of it. And you see him in another shot. And there's been so much, you know, extended universe stuff created about him. And he's shown up in the, in the animated series and stuff. He, he's, he's, he's now an established character. And there's a million action figures and I have them all. But um, it just, there was something in that moment, you know, it was, it was 1980. I was six years old. 
And there was that moment of this strange reptile. Because if you look at if you look at the rest of the bounty hunters, you have Boba Fett, who's in a, he's a, he's obviously a dude in the mask. You have at least two other robots, and then a character that's completely encased in a suit. You know, Zuckus is some sort of insectoid creature, maybe, but it's in a suit. You have Forlom is an R two D two. I mean, a C three PO weird thing with a bug head. IG-88 is another uh, robot. You have Boba Fett, who's a dude in a suit. But then you have Fosk, who is a reptile guy in a flight suit. And I don't know. I just grab, instantly gravitated towards that. You know, I got the action figure and got them all. And it was great. And, uh, you know, there's a story wow. there, though. When you look at Bosk. Yeah. So, okay. Boba Fett. Yeah, he's this dude in the suit, but you don't know anything about the suit. Um, and Forlom and Zuckus and all this other stuff. But you can recognize that um, Bosk is in a flight suit. And because you yep. can recognize it's a flight suit, you can then say, well, I guess he's some sort of a pilot. Okay, what's this lizard dude doing in a ship? And as a flight suit, it kind of looks like the flight suit's worn by the Rebellion. It's that orangey, yellowish color. Yep. So, it allows you to start exploring this story that isn't even a story. Yeah, it's Just like it's a particular a, detail. It's a reptile bounty hunter and why, you know, it's yeah. just like it just, it just lends itself to stories. Alan Harris, who was in the suit, uh, Empire Strikes Back. I thankfully, I thankfully got to meet him last year at Pensacon um, unfortunately, he passed away right. uh, since then. But it was kind of one of those moments where it's like, it's like me as an artist. The reason why I'm doing what I'm doing is because of the work, his work. Okay, so here's here's a question for you. Um, I, I've been I've been asking. Somehow, this has become a question I've asked many people, and uh, but I think it's particularly appropriate for you because um, you work with monsters so much. If you could be taken out by a monster, what monster would you like it to be? What monster would you like to have be your undoing? Uh, so here's the thing. There is a follow-up question, by the way. Yeah. But, uh, but so we don't so we're not ending it on a morbid note. No, right? no. Here's the thing. As a as a as a sixth, no, sixth or seventh, I forget which, as a seventh generation Floridian, mm -hmm. I've had to contemplate my death by many animals <laughs> and and i death by shark or alligator are very low on my my wish list because sure. i don't want to be food for another animal directly i mean ultimately we right. are well, all ultimately we all are but yeah. yeah but but to be eaten by like a shark or an alligator is not ideal <laughs> so <laughs> yeah but i mean i i don't know i i just i i would have thought that i would have gotten enough uh street cred by the monsters that they would give me a pass okay that I, would, I, would, I would i would as, as a as a brother as a father as a creator of monsters that they would not <laughs> They would not claim me for I. I am one of them. I am. I am. I. I am. I. I worship at their church, and I. I speak their language. It's. I. I Fair don't, enough. Okay. Well, then here's the flip side to that question I've been asking people as well. If you could have a monster to be your buddy, to hang out with, to be like your pal, yeah. what monster would you want? Oh, cobalt. Totally cobalt. Cobalt. To cobalt or goblin because they'd be the best little little buddies they'd just be like <laughs> hey what are we gonna do and i'm like because because they have that innate ability to worship a more dominant character no oh, okay like, oh yeah because so i mean cobalts <laughs> worship dragons goblins worship whoever's more whoever's the strongest okay yeah. okay because it's um, like Little gobble because I mean I have a cat that's basically a little little cobalt. <laughs> <laughs> I I always thought it'd be cool to have have an owl bear, you know, just uh, yeah, like a giant like a giant Saint Bernard, but it's like three hundred pounds heavier and you, you it's used to be different. Joe Exotic. That's all you'd end up to be. <laughs> nah, you, maybe maybe you, you get mauled by it. You can't have something that can realize that it can just fucking kill you. Right, but this so is bad but, language. 
but this is this is a, a situation where this one is your buddy. It's down yeah, like yeah. gentle Ben, you know. Now, now you got me thinking it because it's like, oh, <laughs> because it can't be a can't be a beholder and a lithid because they are supreme intelligence and they are they are warped by their manifestation on the material plane right you, you can simply never you. you can never trust them anyway i mean they yeah. say they're your friend and next thing you know boom disintegrated you know yeah well when, when uh when I, star, when I played star wars galaxy uh i was a i was a trandoshan <laughs> surprising <laughs> and my my buddy uh my best friend was in the game as a wookie so that was a really weird relationship you know, because because they always they always say with it, within the concept of the game, it's like no no race or species is an absolute. Just because right. oceans are slavers and hunters doesn't make them all. And it's like yeah, but <laughs> but yes, but so so my trained ocean worked for the rebellion, and this Wookiee worked for the rebellion. We all worked for the rebellion, and we all went on missions together. Chris. Uh... I think that that is a, 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 a mighty and adventurous place to maybe end. Um, thank you so much for, for being on the show. Where can people find your work these days? And where can they find the Grand Bazaar of Ether Vandalia? Well, uh, the best place to find me is at ChristopherBurdette.blogspot.com. I mean, I have a website, but my blog is where everything's happening. Uh, my website is ChristopherBurdette.com. Um, but my blog is where all the links are. It's what I'm talking about, what I'm currently doing. I do have a bizarre web blog too, but it's it all ends up on the main blog first. So go to the Chris Verdet blog, everyone. That's that's yeah. the place. I, I can say from experience that that's where you'll find all sorts of cool stuff and where Chris posts all his great art. Uh, Chris, thanks again for for being on the show. Uh, thank you all for tuning in, and we will have more. Keep checking us out. Hi everyone, thanks for watching Into the Ultra. I hope you enjoyed the interview. If you wanna see more, please subscribe. We drop new episodes every Tuesday. You can also check out some of my other projects. I'm a documentary filmmaker. I made a movie called Plastic Galaxy, the story of Star Wars toys, and I co-produced and co-directed a documentary called Eye of the Beholder, the Art of Dungeons and Dragons. Both are available on Amazon Prime and iTunes and a host of other streaming services. And if you wanna follow along with my newest project, I co-produced it with Cave Girl Productions. It's called Igniting the Spark, the story of Magic the Gathering, and I posted a link to that down in the description. Thank you very much. I hope to see you next Tuesday.